morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can hug somebody next to you. I think it's appropriate. And you can make your way back to your seat. What a moment. Hey, I just want to tell you guys online, too, that that moment is for you. And there's plenty more of that coming, so lean in. And hey, let our team know in the chat where you're tuning in from. We want to welcome you. We got some hosts that want to celebrate that you're here with us. So just receive. Receive no matter where you are all over the globe. Thank you guys for participating in that. Is that good? Is that good? Do you like that cook? I love Jesus. Dude, I love, he, chains are breaking, absolutely. God is in the business of transforming us. Hey, if we haven't met yet personally, my name is Capus Chatfield. Did you guys know I actually had a full name? Some of you only know me as Cap. It's like, whoa, you have a, my full name is Capus Hale Chatfield, not the third. You'd think that I'd be the third with a name like that, but the first, you can call me Cap. Fun fact about me is my name, Capus, means little cabbage in German. All the facts you didn't ask for, you're getting them all today. So, hey, gl I'm glad to be with you guys. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as, the, as an overseer over our online campus. God's just doing a, a lot of really cool things all over the globe. And so can we give it up again for the online people? Because they're actual people. Real people with real names that Jesus paid a high price for. We say behind us, every screen is a soul. And so uh, we're grateful for what God is doing all over the globe, but we're also extremely grateful. And I, I'm particularly grateful to be a part of what God is doing here in Elkhorn, Nebraska. Man, God is doing some really cool things. I'm not the lead pastor of our church. Our lead pastor, Pastor Todd Doxson, his amazing wife, Denise, are in the front. I love you, bro. I love you, man. How many years ago did you guys say yes to God to start this thing? 17 years, this thing started in your mom's basement, right? As a Bible study. And uh, let me just tell you, healthy things grow. And it's really cool to be part of such a healthy church. And I just honor you guys for for uh, your yes, and it's so fun. I've, I'm grateful to be able to teach the word this morning. So if you guys wouldn't mind, please grab your Bibles. You can turn them open. I'm like, it's funny because the first time Pastor Todd ever gave me the pulpit, it was like we were going through like a challenging season as a church, and I think he was probably like, well, it couldn't get much worse than this, so I'm just gonna let this guy teach. He gave me the pulpit. It was from Leviticus 13, the law of leprosy. And I was like, bro, like throwing me in the, in the fire right away. But I'm like, this week, it's almost like full redemption because you can't go wrong with anything from the first few chapters of the book of Acts. So it's going to be super fun. If you guys wouldn't mind opening up to Acts chapter two, I'm going to pray and we'll hop into this. This is going to be fun. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that the word never returns void. We just thank you that when we get around the things that you care about, it's just blessable. And so when we prioritize your word, we know that you love to show up for that. And, and that's what we want, God. We, we, want, we want you to show up in a powerful way. You're the answer to every problem that we have. You are the wisdom for all confusion. You are the healing for every infirmity. And, and that's what we want. We want you to do what you do best. And so show up in a mighty way. I, I pray God too, with the preparation behind this message, it wouldn't be about me being a, a, a prepared preacher. It'd be about people receiving individual words fr straight from you today. So speak, speak to all of us in the way that we need to hear your voice in Jesus name. Amen. If you're taking notes, if you're not taking notes today, it'd be a great day to start taking notes. It's a great discipline to have as a Christian. We're in the middle of a, of a series right now, or it's really like a, a, a we call it vision season. Or, and this is, the heart behind this is to kind of cast vision for where we're going as a church. Who, who was here last week for Vision Sunday? Powerful time. And uh, 
God's just getting started with this theme of strengthen. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to write this on the top of your notes. Three secrets to become a strong Christian. We're gonna be in Acts chapter two. Before we jump into that, I wanna ask you a question. What's the dumbest thing that you pay for? Anybody? You can participate. What's the dumbest thing that you pay for personally? What's that? DoorDash fees? That's debatable. Like, depending on how many kids you have, that's actually, it could be a pretty wise investment. But I love your honesty. Anybody else? Water. What? We got our priorities in all the wrong places. You don't want to pay for water? Like, what else? Jeez. What, <laughs> we're going to have the most shriveled up church next week if people start canceling their, their water bills. Anybody else? What's that? A pet license? What's a pet license? You have to have a license to buy a pet? Are you serious? Bro, America is in worse trouble than I thought. I didn't even realize we're going in that direction. <laughs> that, you see, Joy, there's another reason why we don't need any pets. We don't need to listen to our, our kids when they're asking for dogs. I said, we don't need a dog, we have four dogs. Their names are Brave, Raven, Quinn, and Charlie. We do not need any more things to clean up after. The dumbest thing that I pay for is a CrossFit membership. Let me, let me, let me explain, let me explain. I show up to this, to this CrossFit gym called CrossFit Kinesis almost every single day, and I literally allow people shorter than me <laughs> to torture me to, t to put me through the most grueling workouts to expose all my weaknesses. Just this past Friday, they were making me climb a 20-foot rope. I'm terrified of heights, and I'm climbing this thing, and I'm thinking, this is the dumbest thing that I pay for. I pay for this. <laughs> I pay to show up to this place to have them humble me all the time, and you really, like, at the end of it, you, you kind of pay for, like, the first five seconds after you finish a workout because it's a really good feeling. But it just, it's funny because I'm always turning the person next to me and I'm like, guys, hey, there's more of us than there are of them. <laughs> and who's the one paying the bills here? Like, I'm trying to like set up a coup inside a CrossFit Kinesis. <laughs> no man ever takes me up on it, unfortunately. My, my leadership's probably not as great as I think it is. <laughs> but one of my favorite things that, uh, and I love him, I'm obviously being facetious. I, I enjoy it. Uh, in a very sadistic way, but our coach, uh, Kyle Kasperbauer, he's a member of our church, actually. He's a phenomenal dude. One of the things that he says kind of regularly when we're standing at the whiteboard, he's giving us the workout, he says, fit people are harder to kill. And I'm like, I like that. You know, maybe, maybe I pay just to hear that every once in a while and be reminded. But I was thinking of that principle of, you know, physically fit people are harder to kill. And I don't know, I, I talk about this like almost all the time and it feels like, you know, with the way culture is heading, I don't think we can talk about it enough because I think it's the, the, one of the biggest threats to the church, I think in these days, is slumber, is sleepiness, is us kind of just like casually going through life and not paying attention to what's happening and not recognizing that we're in a spiritual war right now. Guys, we're not in a political war. We're not in a cultural war. We're not in a race war. We're in a spiritual battle right now. And the things that, that people are contending for, the values people are contending for, this is all a manifestation of something that's happening in the unseen realm around us. And here, here's what's really wild. God is not betting on a president. And I love, I love what God is doing in regards to leadership in the country right now, personally. I think it's, it's amazing to see order come back into place, but God is not betting on a president. God is betting on his church. We are God's plan A. Yeah, you can clap for that. It's amazing. It's amazing that in the midst of everything happening in the world right now, God is looking at his church and he says, this is my church that I'm building up and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is betting on you. God is betting on you, Kevin. God is betting on us to do the work, and this is what the Bible says, that when Jesus comes back for his church, he's coming back not for a beaten down bride, not for a bruised bride, but a spotless bride. 
Jesus has every intention of keeping us and giving us victory in these days. But we have a part to play. We, the part that we have to play is we actually have a responsibility, here's what's wild, to be strong. The Bible talks about being strong, not just as like a characteristic. I think sometimes we look at somebody to the left or to the right of us and they say, wow, that's a very strong individual. Look at what they've gone through. Or look at how much weight they can lift or look at how late they can stay up or how early they can wake up. Look at their capacity. God has given that person remarkable strength. And it's just kind of random. It's kind of like the wheel of fortune. Like some people have strength and some people don't have strength. But what's really interesting when you actually look at strength throughout the Bible, it's actually a command. God throughout the Bible says, be strong and very courageous. In fact, I want to read some scriptures for you. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Ephesians 6.10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You probably have also heard that the Bible says, actually, this is interesting, 365 times, one time for every day of the year, it says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. It's almost like God knew that that's a daily vitamin that we need to take, especially in these days. You know what's also interesting? Jesus rebukes cowardice. In the book of Revelation, this is what it says as, as Jesus is coming back for his church. It says in Revelation chapter 21, verse eight, but the cowardly, unbelieving, uh, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all, the, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I mean, that's intense. Like, it's easy for us to look at all the other things, all the things that are very visibly abominable before God, but we miss the first one that he says. God is looking for a bride that will not cower to the lies and deception of this world, but we'll stand confidently in truth. Yeah, praise God. Again, this is, I hope that you're catching this because here's the reality. I don't know about you, but I feel weak in life sometimes. You, like, the weakest I felt in a long time was probably this past couple days because my wife left me alone with the four dogs <laughs> while she went to this women's conference and dude, my arrogance got exposed real quick. I was like, Phew. okay, yeah, let's, house gonna be clean, kids are gonna be fed, everyone's gonna smell really good, and you're gonna come back and I'm gonna just be chilling on the couch. Dude, I'm telling you, we're potty training a three-year-old in the midst of this and it was like, there was stuff everywhere, smeared everywhere. Like, you can't, you, like, you start one activity, all of a sudden, like, someone's crying, you gotta go, and, and all the moms here are like, yeah, bro, like, like we're trying to tell you, and, and like, there's like bags under my eyes and like my wife comes in through the door and I'm like trying to, I'm like trying to like play it off. Like, oh my gosh, it was so great. I'm so glad you had such a good time. And she said, how was it? And I, and I said, I'd much rather be a dad. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> you can be the mom. But, here, but I think in, in, in jest I say that, but at the same time, there was, it was wild, like through these little tiny trivial things that were going on in my life the past few days, it was also exposing a lot, a lot of things in me. And it was like, I caught myself being short with my kids. I caught myself being impatient. And I'm like, man, like here I have an amazing opportunity to be present with, with four of my favorite people on planet Earth. And all of this ugliness is just coming out of me in these moments. And I was like, and then I was feeling condemned on top of it. Because I'm like, man, like I'm not being the person I want to be for these people that I love so dearly. And now I feel like a failure. And in that moment, I'm just like, God, I am really weak. I'm really weak. I'm not as strong as I think I am. And God said to me, it's exactly where I want you to be. The Bible says when we are weak, he is strong, and his grace is sufficient for us. But too many of us, I think, are, are trying to like muscle through life, muscle through the Christian faith, 
and trying to impress people with our strength. And I'm not saying being, being vulnerable in an unhealthy and unwise way. If I just started like having a temper tantrum right now and like bawling my eyes out, like I wouldn't be surprised if you guys didn't show up next week because there's a, there's a way to process vulnerability that's healthy. But the problem is so many of us don't even know how to do that. And God, God, God is in the business of this great exchange sort of thing where it's like, God, I'm reaching the limitation of my capacity as a human being, and I'm asking God for a grace that just bursts through that capacity, that you would overflow me, that you would overtake me, and that you would, you would do abundantly, imag- unimaginably more through me than I could ever ask for. This is the promise for every single one of you. I'm telling you this because the, the temptation, the lie, and this is for people online too, if you, if you see me on my uh, YouTube channel or whatever, and you have any misconception that I got everything perfectly figured out, please hear me loud and clear. I am a work in process. I am desperately in need for the grace of God. But let me tell you, I do not at the same time live in this victim mindset of woe is me and, and, and back in the way. No, I'm, I cling to the grace of God because his grace really is sufficient for me. I'm not talking about a woe is me false humility. It's a humility that says, God, in and of myself, I'm not enough. And that is why I'm clinging to the promises of your word. Because I, I know that you can, you are more than enough through me. And you can make me Strong. Here's the three things I want to cover today about how we can become strong Christians. The first point I want you to write down is we need to pursue the anointing. I'm going to talk about that more in depth if you've never heard that word before, so stay, stay tuned. Number two, we need to prioritize God's house. And number three, we need to put demands on God's word. It's probably my favorite one, so... Buckle up. Stick around to the end because it's going to get really good. Point number one, pursuing the anointing. I told us to open up to Acts chapter two, but let me give a little bit of preface of what happened before Acts chapter two. You're all, if you've been around for a little bit and you're somewhat familiar of the Christian faith, you're probably already familiar that we worship this guy named Jesus who is the son of God. He came down from heaven. He's always existed. He's always been and always will be, but he came down from heaven to planet Earth, to die a death for human beings like you and me that frankly we deserve to die ourselves. The Bible says that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of our sin is death, eternal separation from God. So what does Jesus, the Son of God, do? He comes down to planet Earth, lives a sinless life that he might be the perfect sacrifice for us. So instead of us receiving death eternally, he takes death upon himself and gives us his righteousness. So that's what Jesus does. He comes down, lives, is crucified, he's nailed to a cross, put in a tomb, and on the third day is rose from the grave. He raises himself from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all the people who were following him, they could barely believe it when they saw him come back to life. But he spent 40 days with them after he had resurrected, kind of like giving them a strategy for how to build the church and just like fellowshipping with them, enjoying their friendship. But then he was gonna leave again. He was gonna ascend back to heaven and before he did, he gave them this one charge. He said, do not leave this room. They were all gathered in an upper room together. He said, do not leave this room until the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why was he saying this? He was saying this because he doesn't want to set up his church for failure. Jesus knew that the wiles of the devil and the culture were so strong that if the church was sent out to go and expand the kingdom, but they didn't have the power to do so, they were going to be set up for failure. So what Jesus said was, wait for the Father to give you what he promised you, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. What he's saying is, I need to clothe you with my self. I need to clothe you with my power so that when you go out there, you're not relying on on your laurels. You're not relying on what you're capable of. You're not relying on your weakness. The Bible says in Zechariah, check this out, in Zechariah chapter four, verse six, so he answered and said said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. So this is what happens in Acts chapter two. 
Acts chapter two, verses one through four, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, I love this. This is like my favorite story in the entire Bible. Because what you see happen here is you see ordinary people overcome by an extraordinary power. You see natural men and women overcome by a supernatural power to go and do greater works than even Jesus did. This is what Jesus promised us as his disciples. He said, you will go and do greater works than even I did. But how did they receive this power? Through persevering prayer, through pursuit. I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, like my prayer life is like, is, <laughs> it's super weak. It's like I might throw up some static before bed, like, oh, Lord, thank you. Yeah, anybody else, like, yeah, can we just be honest? Or like you start taking a bite out of your meal, and you're like, you got food in your mouth. You're like, Lord, thank you for this. And then you just keep eating. And we just kind of go on through our life. Like, let's be real. Like, like, we're so busy with life. And then we come to church, and we receive a message, but we're like half here, half somewhere else, maybe on our phone, maybe we leave early. And I'm not trying to shame anybody. But what I'm saying is, if there's anybody in this room that's like, man, like, why am I not walking in power in my life? Why am I not seeing God do the supernatural through me? Why am I short with my spouse all the time? Let me tell you, this thing comes at a price. Pursuing the anointing comes with crushing. When we talk about anointing, what is anointing? Anointing is this picture of oil. There's a, there's a picture in the Bible of the Holy Spirit being like, olive oil, right? And the olive oil is like literally covering you from head to toe. And, and what does oil do? Oil is a lubricant. It makes, it removes friction. So when we're covered with the power of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, I'm not saying trials don't come. I'm saying that you move through trials with an ease and a grace. This is what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does. But here's how you get olive oil. You crush olives. You don't just Go to the store and buy the olive oil. To make olive oil, you've got to crush the olives, and that's what produces the oil. And in my life, what I've discovered is, is the seasons of my life when, I'm, when I am least willing to press in and hunger for God, those are the seasons when I'm walking in the, great, in the least amount of power. But the seasons when, I, when I'm taking advantage, when I'm driving the car, taking advantage when I'm in the shower, taking advantage when, when I'm doing a workout, and I'm, and I'm in those moments and I set my mind on Jesus, and I say, God, in this moment, I want to redeem the time with every passing second, I wanna focus on you, I wanna press in, that is how you receive the overflowing abundance of the power of the Holy Spirit. This year, this next year in 2025, here's my challenge to each and every one of us. How are we going to grow in pursuing the presence of God? It's gonna cost us something. It's gonna cost us comfort, it's gonna cost us sleeping in a little bit in the morning. But I'm telling you, if you're, if you're coming to this place today and you say, Cap, I want, I want to know God's power. I want to know his anointing. My encouragement to you is it is readily available for all of us, but will we press in? The disciples in the upper room, they didn't just wait there passively. They pressed in in prayer. They persevered together, and then this breakthrough happened. And that breakthrough, my friends, is readily available for you. I wanna give you one other tip that I think is, we don't talk about enough as the Western church, but this has been an absolute game changer in my life. And I'll talk about this more in depth. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, a Bible study on my YouTube channel this week about the gift of tongues. Because this thing that we see right here, it's like, wow, that's cool, that's interesting. It's very, it's very mysterious. It's like, it's not, it's not a very, how do I say this? Our minds, our intellect, they're deeply offended by this thing right here, the gift of tongues. In this scenario, what we see in Acts chapter two is that the gift of tongues in this scenario 
was actually an evangelistic tool by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. They begin praying and worshiping, and all of a sudden, they're miraculously speaking in languages that currently exist, but they had never learned before. So you have all of these Jews who had gathered to this area, and they're hearing the gospel being preached in their own native languages from all over the world through these people. So this is a moment where people are marveling, and they're like, oh my gosh, like, this is like, how do they know my language? How are they talking about God in my language? It was an evangelistic tool. But what we see also in scripture is that there's different kinds of tongues. And one kind that I wanna talk about is the, the gift of a prayer language. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse four. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Like uh, Romans 8, 26 through 27, here's another great scripture about this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, we, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Can I make it like very simple for us? There is one operation of the gift of tongues, which is for public ministry. But then there's another operation, which is for private intercession all on your own. This is where you're coming before God. And here's what's so amazing. This is what blows my mind about God. He gives us like an emergency eject button when we don't know what to pray. Have you ever been in a situation where you were so overwhelmed, you couldn't even pray in English anymore? Like your words failed you. You're like, I don't, I, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. I don't even know what to say. This is a gift of mercy from God. So that in those moments, we just yield ourselves to his spirit and we say, God, I'm allowing my mind to go to a different place. I'm not praying from my mind today. I'm praying from my spirit. This is not the same as praying gibberish. This is a holy language that God gives his people that is the perfect will of God. You know who never misses prayer? God, he's the best prayer ever. He knows what's in God's heart, he knows what's in God's mind, and so this is for me, this is something that I try to practice as much as possible in worship, especially if it's a new song. Hello, I don't know those lyrics. I, I, I mean, I'm just gonna wait until there's a song that I know how to sing, right? Start praying in this prayer language because this is an opportunity. What does the Bible say? It edifies the person who prays. This is like spiritual CrossFit. I, it really is. So for me, what's amazing is in my prayer life, you might be thinking, Cap, how do I receive this thing? It's, there's, <laughs> I wish I could give you a formula like step A, do this, step B, do this. Here's, here's how simple God is. He honors hunger. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. And I'm not gonna shame you for not pursuing it. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse one, pursue love and desire the gifts. I think sometimes we look at spiritual gifting as like, well, it's all God's choice and it's random, so I'm just gonna wait until he decides to do it. He decides how to disperse things in a public setting, but you actually have permission to desire these things. You have permission to ask for these things. And the question is, is are we gonna actually pursue it or are we going to practice it? But I'm telling you, there's something really special. I, we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to go a little bit longer into this topic because I think it's so important for our church today. When we don't know what to pray and we yield to the, the power of the Holy Spirit and we start uttering things where our mind is actually analyzing what we're saying and we're like, what the heck is going on right now? Is that really me or is that God? That's what happens when you're yielded to the Spirit. You can operate a car, you can listen to worship. There's things that you can do with your mind, your natural mind, while your spirit is petitioning the things of God. So honestly, like, and I'm not saying this because I want you guys to watch me, but I give you permission. If I'm in worship and you were to glance over at me, oftentimes you will see my mouth moving in ways that don't match what's going on on the screen. And it's not for show, it's for edifying myself and it's also, I don't know what's going on in the spirit realm, I don't know what demons are, are working in here. I don't know what, what battles are being waged between angels and demons right now. So when I'm praying in the spirit, I'm petitioning God's perfect will to orchestrate things the way that he wants to orchestrate them. It is the greatest hack. It's like a cheat code. It's like a legit cheat code. If you don't, if you're, 
Here's the simple invitation. If this is growing you in a hunger and you're like, I'm very curious, get alone with God in your car, in the closet. Don't just wait 30 seconds and see if it happens or not. Press in and say, God, I'm willing for you to offend my mind. Because the biggest thing I think that's keeping us from experiencing great spiritual breakthrough, breakthrough is what's going on between our two ears. We're so intellectual that we've, we've really put spirituality on the altar, but God will say, hey, I can work, I can work with that humility. Lord, I put my intellect on the altar, offend how I think you should operate. I am desperate for a power and an ability to communicate and commune with you. He's, please give me this gift. There's moments, actually, let me read this for you. I think this is a really cool quote from a guy named Smith Wigglesworth. Dude, talk about a name, are you kidding me? Like, I can't imagine. He needed Jesus in elementary school, that's for sure. <laughs> that's rough. <laughs> this is what he says. I mean, he was, he was a, a, a church history gangster. I mean, this guy's ministry was like very bizarre. Talk about offending the mind. Like crazy, miraculous healings, deliverances, raising the dead, you know, just the stuff Jesus commanded us to do. Like, he's just doing that all the time. And then this is what he said. He said, I never pray for more than 15 minutes. Sometimes I think we're like, well, I, I don't have 10 hours to pray. He, he said, I never pray for more than 15 minutes, but I never go more than 15 minutes without praying. There's a difference between having a prayer life and a life of prayer. A prayer life is, God, I kind of discipline myself to have this 20 minutes, like this 20 minutes are yours, and then I'm off doing my own thing. A life of prayer is what the Bible says, praying without ceasing, a continual conversation with God. He says, I never pray for more than 15 minutes, but I never go more than 15 minutes without praying. When I don't know what to pray for, I pray in the spirit until the anointing comes. Any, can I just get a raise of hands? Has anybody here ever received a personal prayer language? to pray in the spirit. Raise your hand a little bit higher, okay? I want you guys to see this, like this is, this, we gotta normalize this a little bit better. There's a lot of people here who are actually saying, yeah, this is something that I practice. Who here has been in a situation where you lacked peace, confidence, strength, all of it, and you pressed in and, and praying in your prayer language and all of a sudden you felt a shift happen. You felt peace come upon you. You felt like a breakthrough. I'm telling you, this is real. When you feel like some days you think I'm just having a bad day, it could be severe spiritual oppression. You're like, I don't know what's going on. There's something happening in the unseen realm. And if you work, if you pursue this, you actually can distance yourself from that oppression. But will you and I pursue the anointing until the breakthrough happens? The first point, pursuing the anointing. Number two, prioritizing God's house. I'm gonna jump to Acts 2, 40 through 47. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. This is Peter speaking. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So here's the sequence of events. The church prays. They petition for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. Peter begins preaching boldly. And then you know what they do after? They start partying. They start having dinner parties. Like, it's not that complicated. They just start getting together, watching the Super Bowl, breaking bread, doing the Lord's Supper. They were having a good time to one another. But you know what's, you know what's so important about this? There was a devoted commitment to covenantal relationship with God's people. I was, uh, my wife and I were just in Mexico recently and we ran into some people who uh, were a part of a church and they were, they were extremely hurt by how some things went down. Some things were said that they felt like shouldn't have been said. 
Some things were unsaid that they felt like should be said. Hello, anybody here? Anybody here realize that the people who lead churches aren't perfect? Okay? So they experienced this, and their only reaction, their only response was to leave the church. And yeah, there's, there's groaning because we know, we've, we all can think of somebody who's gone through that. And frankly, I don't, I don't blame people. I don't blame people for not being trained in what it looks like to be committed to covenantal relationship. But can I tell you something? The isolated sheep gets picked off by the wolf. I believe there's people literally listening online right now who are saying, Cap, I, I've been to church. I've been around other believers. I've been hurt too badly. I love God, though, so I just stay at home and I watch online. And my challenge to you is that is not God's best for your life. God's best for our life is not to do Christianity in isolation. Christianity is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. We need each other. We are the body of Christ. How can one member say to another member, I don't need you? How can the hand say to the foot or the foot say to the eye or the nose say to the knee, I don't need you? We all need each other. And there's things that we learn about God's grace by doing life with frictionful relationship. The Bible says we're called to submit to one another. How do you submit to one another when you agree on everything? God wants us to be around people that we don't see eye to eye with, that smell bad, that dress weird, that spit when they talk. God wants us to be around other people because this is how we learn to operate in his love for other people. And when we operate in his love for other people, we get an extra dose of his love for us. This is God's design for us to become more like Jesus and to grow more in relationship with him. It does not happen outside of covenantal relationship with the church. Here's the challenge I wanna invite you guys into this next year. Which group are you gonna be a part of? Which small group are you going to join? For some of you, it's what small group are you going to lead? We gotta start creating some pockets, some more circles for people to jump in and get involved in covenantal relationship here. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm telling you, we have a lot of people online, for example. Very practical tip, I want you to pray through this. We have people online from time zones all over the world who are, who are in a struggle because they're like, man, I can't find a men's group that works in my, for my time zone, day, time, or whatever. And so, dude, there's an absolute opportunity right now. You don't even need to leave your house. You could start a Zoom Bible study. You don't even need to be a Bible teacher. You just need to love God, and you need to know how to read a book. And if you can read this book, you can take a, a reading guide and help facilitate conversations around God's word. I'm telling you, man, like, let's not overcomplicate this. But there are people who are literally dying and on their way to hell because they're not getting discipled in the word of God. If only they could come into covenantal relationship with people that genuinely care about them. There's a, there's a quick testimony I'd like to share. I won't put the guy on blast, but I just think this is such a beautiful picture of what, of what God is charging us to step into in this next season. There's a guy in our body who's been like a faithful guy, faithfully pouring out, praying for people, and he's in a situation right now where he's been in desperate need of a kidney transplant. And you can imagine all the emotions that are swirling around the family and, and praying for like a, a direct match and all that sort of stuff. Well, it just so happens that there's another guy in our body who has great relationship with him who's a perfect match. And this Thursday, he is going to sacrifice one of his kidneys to give to this other man so that he can spend a handful of more years on planet Earth with us and his loved ones. Talk about covenantal relationship through thick and thin. In a world where divorce is like, you know, you could flip a coin and see if a marriage is gonna last or not. Could it be that this is the type of commitment that the world needs to see? that people that aren't even blood related, people that aren't even married, can have this sort of dog commitment to one another, this covenantal relationship. Jesus said, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. Yes. Let's make that a commitment this next year because when we do, when I'm weak, I'm telling, look at the picture. When one man is weak, you got an army of men coming around him who make him 
strong. This is what God wants to invite each and every one of us into in this season. And finally, number three, if we wanna grow in strength as Christians, we need to put a demand on God's word. We need to start taking God's word seriously and putting it to the test. This is what it says in Acts chapter three, verses one through nine. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, or asked for, asked for money. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, the beggar, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Bro, I don't know if I have the faith to do that. Are you kidding me? Can you imagine how awkward that might feel? You see somebody who's, who's in a, a tough situation, they're literally, they're lame, they're not able to walk. Could you imagine having the faith to just literally pick them up and stand them up on their feet? I'm telling you, in my weaker moments, this is how I would pray. If it's God's will, maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't. Or, hey, maybe like just come back to me in a year and we'll see what happens. But to see this type of faith, this type of expectation that Jesus was actually going to fulfill his word, he says, get up and walk. And look at what happened. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. You know what's so interesting about this moment? This guy, the guy who was begging for the money, he had no grid of what Jesus came and did. He had no grid of Jesus' reputation and all of the people that Jesus came and healed. He was asking, he was asking for what felt natural, what seemed right to a man. I just need some money just to survive today. But then Peter and John walk up, walk up on this guy and Peter and John's faith saw a different future for this man. They picked him up and here's what's so amazing about faith. Faith is contagious. This man who had never walked a day in his life, all of a sudden he's catching the faith of these men who were helping him up. And as he gets up, here's what's so crazy. As he gets up, the strength comes to his ankles. Sometimes I think we go through life and we're saying, God, when I finally feel strong, I'll step in. When my finances are finally right, I'll start tithing. When I feel like I've learned enough about your word, I'll begin a group. When I feel like the anointing has hit me, I'll go and pray for that person. When I feel bold enough to go and share the gospel with my neighbor, then I will do it. But what we see in this picture is that in our weakness, if we choose to put a demand on God's word and say, God, if you said it, that settles it. I'm going to move and align my body with what your spirit is saying. God gives strength to the weak parts of our lives. Dear, I mean, let the Holy Spirit speak to you in what, in what area of your life this needs to be applied. Maybe for you, you know God has given you the gift of healing and you've been hesitant because you're like, man, I don't know. I don't wanna lay my hands on someone to pray for them and something not happen and then all of a sudden God gets the rap for it. God's not, God's not worried about that. God wants your faith. And take yourself out of the equation. It wasn't about you anyway, but could we, be, could we have childlike faith and say, God, nevertheless, at your word, Either this word is true or, or, or I'm going bust. Like this, I'm going all in on this thing in 2025. For some people in here who've been struggling financially, I, I can't imagine tithing. I can't imagine giving God the first and best 10% of my resource. I get it, I was there myself. But could I tell you this? The Bible says that God actually gives us this system of giving and sowing into God's kingdom to actually break you out of poverty to break you out of lack because the Bible says when you seek first God and his righteousness, all else gets added to you. When you give, whatever measure you give will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing, making room for more. I'm telling you today, God is asking for faith in 2025. Just say, God, you know what? I'm done trying to 
map out my life according to my own understanding. I'm just going to say yes to your word. I'm going to say yes to your word. I'm going to go to my neighbor or my coworker that, that they know that I go to church and I've never invited them. I've never shared my faith with them. And God, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm honestly terrified of the idea of fumbling as I share the gospel with them. But I'm trusting that even with this feeble, stuttering mouth, as I testify that I was once blind and now I can see that that will be enough to be the spirit of prophecy in somebody else's life, that what you've done in me, you're willing to do in them. And I'm willing, I'm willing to look like a fool to this world to stand on what your word says. This is how we receive supernatural strength. Pursuing the anointing, prioritizing God's house, being in covenantal relationship with other believers and putting a demand on God's word saying, God, if you said it, that settles it. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would strengthen us. Your word says, that physical exercise profits a little, CrossFit might profit a little, but godliness profits in all things in this life and in the life to come. And I pray, God, that we would get, we would get a, a workout plan put together. We would pray through a workout plan for this year of what does it look like for me to develop a life of prayer? What does it look like for me to seek you for greater anointing? What does it look like for me to stir up the gifts that you put inside of me this year and not be afraid of failing or looking weird or making a mistake? What does it look like for me to prioritize the house of God this year? What does it look like for me to actually, I'm, I'm going to prophesy to someone online, you have been looking for a church to be a part of and you found it at Love Church in Omaha, Nebraska, and God is inviting you to come here before you figured out all the details, I'm telling you, you just say yes to God like I did in 2014 when I moved from Hollywood, Florida, all the way to Omaha, Nebraska, and I've never looked back. I met my wife, I have four kids, I got a home, I got a job. God figured it out, but I say yes to him, and my invitation to you is in 2025, prioritize proximity to God's house above your job, above your neighbors, above where God, all the other things that you like about your life, say, God, what house are you calling me to help build in 2025 and make it a priority? And Father, finally, I pray, God, that the word would come alive for us this year, that we wouldn't just gloss over it and say, okay, that's cool, that might have worked back then or it might work for them. God, we wanna see that word activated in our lives and through our lives this next year, in Jesus' name, amen.